Hello and uh, happy Wednesday evening to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us again and uh, I thank you for your time and attention as we share in the Lord's Word together. Uh, today uh, I would like to talk about Judah, the man Judah. Of course he is uh, one of the sons of Jacob. Uh, he represents one of the tribes uh, of Jacob, of Israel. And just like some of the other people um, that the Lord calls great men of God, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, uh, they had some flaws. There are some things in their lives, even sinful things. But yet, despite that, the Lord, once he puts his mark upon them, he brings them out to be great men of God and to fulfill his purpose. And as we talk about him, I want that to be an encouragement to us. Um, often we think that we've gone too far, we've messed up too much. Surely the Lord will not use us. But we are called according to his good pleasure, to his divine purpose. And once he locks in on us, his faithfulness, his commitment is there to uphold us so that we can fulfill what he desires in us. That's what it's all about, his purpose in our lives. But let's look at the life of Judah. Now here's a guy, uh, if you remember the story, his father, uh, Jacob, was in love with Rachel and he wanted to marry her and he made arrangements with his father-in-law Laban and As they have the wedding he goes into her uh, to consummate the marriage so to speak and The next morning he realizes that it's not Rachel, but it is her sister Leah that he has married Woo! What a surprise that must have been a great uh, morning in the tent there um Despite that, Jacob has to work for a total of 14 years in order to uh, marry Rachel. But he's married to both of them. And the scripture says that um, God sees that uh, Jacob hates Leah. Now again, that word doesn't mean a literal hated. Uh, probably more of a uh, he loved her less um, for obvious reasons. But because of that, the Lord blessed her with children so that she would find favor in the eyes of her husband. So right out of the bat, she comes out and she produces four children. Judah is the fourth. Okay, so he's not the oldest like Reuben. He's not the baby like Joseph. And of course, he comes into this story. So he's got a, a family situation that was kind of altered. And not only that. Jacob, the scriptures tells us, that he uh, loves Joseph the most. He is favored amongst all the brothers because he is the son of his old age. He's the youngest, and he finds the most pleasure in him. So you have a dynamic here. And by the way, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's a good one. I would advise parents to be very cautious of favoring one child over the other. And it can happen. Some kind, sometimes uh, some kids are nicer than the other ones. It's, it's the way it is. There are temperaments. There are dispositions. They may honor differently. They may behave uh, differently. They may stay out of more trouble. And sometimes you could find yourself liking one over the other. <laughs> I'm not making it up. It happens. I know Trish and I have been very careful to, to love our three boys equally. And uh, we honestly have not had favorites with them because I know that even though their temperaments are very different and even though some of their temperaments are more tolerable to us than others, I know that that temperament, not their disobedience, but that temperament, that personality that they have is of the Lord and he has a purpose for them and they may need that temperament over the, besides what another sibling has. So we've always found it easy, uh, natural to, to love them equally. And, and we do. And I would recommend that. But just be careful. Because in this situation, it caused some trouble. And you know the story of Joseph. And Judah was amongst the brothers who hated this guy. Here you have jo Joseph. And I don't think he was a punk. You know, you hear that he tattles on them. Um, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to read some of this. I would love to read all of it because there's so much there. We just don't have the time. But fortunately, you know the story. 
the brothers are doing something, he goes back and he tells the father. So you think, oh, he's a tattletale. And I remember even talking to, uh, talking to my kids when they were growing up, um, and we need to advise, you need to advise your children too. You know, tattletaling is kind of, sometimes you really need to do it, and sometimes you don't, even as adults. Um, and I think if we can look at our hearts and say, what is my motivation for sharing this story with someone in authority? Is it because I want that person in authority, the boss, uh, the parent, uh, um, the pastor? Is it because I want them to like me more, so I'm willing to put down and squeal on something that someone else did? That is not a good motivation. If that's where your heart is, you probably need to zip it. On the other hand, if someone is truly in danger, or there is something going wrong in the workplace, in the job, in the home, and you file that you find that honestly that there's uh, someone or that organization, whatever it is, could be a jeopardy. Then you need to say something. So even if we look at our hearts when it comes to tattling, it's not just kids. Again, adults do it too. But Joseph comes and he tells on his brothers. So they already don't like him. He's got the multicolored coat. Uh, they, the dad likes him the most. Now he's tattling on him. Then to make it worse, he comes to them telling them about these dreams twice we're essentially saying yeah you guys are going to bow down to me yeah that would kind of make you upset um so you, you might get the impression he might be a little bit of a, a punk joseph but i really don't think so because when we look at him throughout his lifetime as we see in the scripture he's a remarkable guy so i think he had uh, just a lot of sincerity and just sharing these dreams uh, because because he wanted to i don't think he meant anything ill but judah hated him because of it to the extent that he and his brothers plotted, hey, here comes, jo uh, um, here comes Joseph, his father Jacob had sent him out to check on him. Uh, let's kill him, let's just take him out. And then they decide, no, 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 let's just throw him in the pit down there with no water, just leave him down there. And it's Judah that gets the idea. He says, hey, why kill him? Why do we want that blood on our hands? Why don't we sell them to the slave traders? Oh, we'll make some money. Why not profit from this uh, dastardly deed? That's Judah. That's what he comes up with. Again, this is one of, the, one of the great saints in the Bible. This is a guy that is very significant in Bible history. It's his idea to do that. And as we go through, um, as we go through the story of Joseph in, the, in Joseph in the book of Genesis, in chapter 38, it kind of diverts and it talks more about Judah specifically. And let me read some of that. Uh, in Genesis chapter 38, uh, it happened at verse 1. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a servant, a Dolomite, who is named Hira. It's right there, you, you know, that Judah turning aside. In other words, there's the way it should be, the way the Lord instructs us, the way that instructs us, the way that the Lord and the commandments had outlined. Judah turns aside from that, and boy, does he! Um, we got to watch those turns, folks. Um, when it comes to the things of God, straight and narrow is the way to go. But Judah takes a turn; he hangs a left. Let's read on here. Uh, there, Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. So Shua is the Canaanite. The Canaanites are not of the people of God. They're not supposed to be mingling with them. In fact, they're quite the enemy of God, of, of Israel. Um, so he, he sees her daughter, the Shua's daughter. He took her and went into her. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Uh, so here you, you see that Judah goes in, he, he meets this Canaanite uh, girl. He's got three kids with her now. Again, this is out of the commandments of the Lord. He told them specifically not to intermingle, not to intermarry especially um, with women that were outside of Israel. That's exactly what he did. He's got three kids. Now, I'm not going to read uh, some of the rest of this, but basically, the scripture says that his first son, Ur, was such an evil guy that the Lord just took him out, just killed him. He's gone. The, um, but 
he, Judah, went and found a wife for him before he was taken out. Uh, her name was Tamar. So Judah finds Tamar to marry Ur. And they do, they get married, but the Lord takes Ur out. Judah approaches the second son, Onan, and says, Listen, by law, you need to marry Tamar, your brother's, your deceased brother's wife, and so that she could bear children and have a family. That's your obligation under the law. Onan says, Fine, but he pulls a bit of a stump. I'm not going into detail, but anyway, he goes into her, but then the seed ends up going on the ground. Hopefully you get my drift. So God sees that as such an evil because he is shirking his responsibility, his obligations under the law of God to provide for his deceased brother's wife by doing this, that he takes him out too. So you have Ur and Onan are both killed by, by the Lord. Judah tells Tamar, listen, wait until the youngest, um, Shelah, Wait until he is old enough, and I'll have him marry you. So just stay single for a while, stay widow, and when he's old enough, I'll have him marry you. Great. Years pass, and uh, Judah's wife passes away. So now he's without a wife. And during this time, these years have gone on, Sheila has grown to the age where he can marry, but... Uh, Judah never has him marry Tamar. Tamar is left out there. So Tamar uh, hears that Judah is nearby, and she goes, she takes off her clothes of mourning, and she, she dresses, she covers her face, and she's waiting outside. Judah comes out. He thinks that she is a prostitute, and he goes with her. And he makes an arrangement. He says, okay, so what is this going to cost me? And uh, he says, how about I'll give you a, a goat? You know, a goat, yeah. Uh, so she says, fine, but I want something of yours to make sure that you're going to bring this goat to me. He didn't have to goat on him. You don't carry goats around. So he says, okay. So he gives her his signet, his staff. Oh, and there's one other thing. Oh, goodness. He gives her three things to just so for her to hold to make sure that she indeed does come back. Oh, it's the signet, the staff. Oh, forgive me. Well, anyway, he gives her these things to prove that he's going to come back. So he leaves. When he comes back in town, he brings the goat with him. And he instructs the people with him, go find this prostitute. And they're like, there is no prostitute down here. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, the one that kind of hangs outside the gate. We don't have a prostitute. There's, there's no one there. And <clears throat> so he's like, oh, well, fine. He gets back and someone comes and tells him, listen, I got some bad news. Uh, Tamar has been immoral. And not only that, she's got a baby. And of course, it's from Judah, from their meeting. So Judah says, take her, get her, and bring her out and burn her. How quick they are, how quick we are to pronounce judgment. Um, you think of uh, David with the prophet, prophet Nathan. When Nathan tells him about this hypothetical situation of this, of this shepherd who takes this one precious sheep, and, and David's quick reaction to judgment until Nathan says, you are that man. So Judah hears of this, and he's enraged. He says, take her and, and burn her. But then Tamar, she says, the person that's done to me, I have some of his belongings, and she presents him uh, the staff, the signet, and the thing I can't think of. Um, <clears throat> and he realizes what has been done. So let me just read in verse, <clears throat> sorry, in 38, uh, verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Uh, moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law. I mean, what a scene. They're bringing this girl out, ready to tie her at the stake and burn her for what she's done. Um, and she tells the father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. After she said, please identify whose these are, 
the signet, the cord, that's what it was, and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her, uh, give her to my son, Sheila, and she did not, uh, he did not know her again. So here he's presented with what's happened, that it was his children. And instead of trying to uh, defend his action, make excuses, blatantly lie about it, deny anything, he fesses up. And she ends up having twins. Um, uh, why? Well, twins happen to run in the family, right? Because uh, um, Judah's father and uncle were twins, Jacob and Esau. So she has twins, and they are uh, Perez and Zerah. And as they stay um, in Israel, they prosper. And you get the impression that, that he stays and takes care of them as his family. Now, we fast forward, and you know the story. And Joseph ends up going to Potiphar's house and then to prison, then ultimately ends up being second in command. There's a time of, um, there's a time of drought, and Jacob... The patriarch realizes that he's got to go to Egypt to buy some grain. So he sends the family. And here goes the brothers on Jacob and on Israel's behalf to try to get some food. And you know that Joseph, they don't recognize him. And he kind of puts them through it for a while. Uh, really making them sweat it out. Telling them they're spies. Sending them back to get Jacob. Sending them back to get Benjamin. But you could see the character of Judah in this situation. When they go back to Jacob and say, listen, um, this Pharaoh guy or his, his head henchman, he wants, he wants to see Benjamin. And Jacob's like, no way. Reuben steps up, the older brother, and he says, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, let me take Benjamin. If he doesn't make it back, you could kill my two children. Okay, so you may think, well, that's kind of... Uh, I guess that's stepping up, but he's offering his kids, not himself, which is kind of creepy. Um, Judah hears that, because Jacob doesn't go for that arrangement, but Judah hears that. Now, Judah's the fourth, so rightfully, Reuben had the responsibility to help mend the situation. But Judah stands up and he says, listen, uh, uh, Dad, I'll be personally, be personally responsible if I do not bring Benjamin back to you, you blame it on me, and I will bear that that blame forever. So here, Judas, you know, this is the guy that um, wanted to sell him into slavery in the first place. This is the guy who gets entangled in this um, in these uh, this Gentile woman and these kids, and thinking his daughter in law is a prostitute, a big mess. And he's got the integrity to stand up amongst all of his brothers and make this offer. Then they get into Back into Egypt, uh, Joseph is demanding again, he kind of tricks them, he puts some money in Benjamin's um, um, satchel, and they get called back in. And it is Judah that's the one, because Joseph said, well, I'm going to keep Benjamin here until you go and you bring your father this time. You can tell Joseph's trying to get the whole family together. Judas stands up again in this situation. He says, oh no, let me stay. Uh, I'll stay here. You keep me in prison until uh, they come back with Jacob. Please don't let him take Benjamin. It would destroy my father. I don't even want him to realize he's not with them. Let it be me. So here you have Judah who rises to the occasion uh, several times here. And the integrity of God is beginning and showing itself in, in this man's life. And it's a precious thing. Judah, when Jacob pronounced a blessing on him, he even told him that, his, that he would have a throne that would last. And it speaks of the nation of Israel splitting in that kingdom of Judah, along with Benjamin, uh, separating. And for that being a longer lasting, a more pleasing kingdom to God, not to mention the lineage of Christ. Because if you go into the book of Matthew, when you start looking at the begats, um, it, it says right in there, Jacob begat Judah, who begat 
Perez, and it even mentions Tamar in there. <laughs> I love it when the Lord takes messed up people who are not perfect, who are disobedient in many ways, like this guy, and still willing to use them for his purpose and his plan. Judah, what a guy, what a guy. Made some big mistakes, but he got it right and ultimately fulfilled what the Lord has for him. Please don't despair your mess ups. I know they happen. Please try to get away from them as best you can and serve the Lord and be the most obedient you could conjure up. It is well worth it. But don't let the enemy beat you up and think that you don't deserve. Well, I'm sorry. You do not deserve. That's a bad word. That, that the Lord cannot still take you and do with you what he pleases in order to give him glory. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again for your attention. Good night.